This is the story of DMT, or dimethyltryptamine, a simple compound found throughout nature which has profound effects on human consciousness. One of the things, besides what it does, one of the things about DMT that, uh, that always fascinated me was the fact that it's such a simple molecule. DMT stands for dimethyltryptamine, NN dimethyltryptamine. If you actually look at the ring structure of DMT itself, you only have really four positions that you can attach things to. So you can make diethyl or dipropyl. There are some other types of carbon chains you can attach to that end that do give you compounds that have activity, but very different from DMT. It biosynthetically, it's two steps from tryptophan right, uh, two trivial enzymatic steps from tryptophan. Well, tryptophan is an amino acid, of course, and it's everywhere. So all organisms have tryptophan, and all organisms have the two key enzymes that lead to the synthesis of DMT. And these enzymes are very ancient enzymes. They're all over the place. They're, again, part of basic metabolism. So theoretically, anything could synthesize DMT. DMT is uh, astonishingly widely available in plants and animals all, all around the world, but so far nobody really knows why it's there or what its, or what its function is. That's the $64 billion question, <laughs> is why is DMT in our bodies? Why is it in plants and all sorts of mammals? What is the role it plays in humans? The conventional wisdom 30, 40 years ago was that these things had no real function. They were just sort of physiological noise. But that's a very naive understanding. And what we now understand is that these secondary compounds are, in a sense, the language of plants. These are messenger molecules. This is what plants use to mediate their relationships with other organisms in the environment. Why is it that human beings' central nervous system are wired to receive this experience? Must be that, uh, you know, there, there's important information to be learned. So I don't think it's universally present in nature by accident. It has a real function. We have co-evolved with these plants. There's a purpose and a, and a meaning to it. So it really fits in with the notion that DMT may be the common molecular language, resonant language, among all living beings on this planet and maybe others as well. I can't think of a more powerful tool to explore the whole question of what is consciousness. These substances are tools that can be used to expand awareness in all areas of life and apply that expanded awareness in, uh, for the betterment of people's lives and their community, their families, and our society. The good news is that there's a growing number of Westerners and, and actually intellectual scientists, artists, movers and shakers, filmmakers and so on who realize that uh, this stuff is all too interesting just to go on uh, keeping it swept under the tea, the spirit molecule. You know, it's a conundrum, it's a paradox. What uh, the spirit is the inner world. Uh, the molecule is the external world. So the psychedelics or entheogens uh, take us from the science to the spirit. I was drawn to the pineal gland, which is a very small organ in uh, the center of the brain, which uh, has always been an object of interest and even veneration for a lot of esoteric physiological disciplines. I thought you know, it wasn't totally crazy to presume a pineal uh, site of origin of DMT, um, which, you know, fit in nicely with my theory that the pineal was somehow involved in actually occurring mystical states. 
This hypothesis proposes that the pineal gland at certain times when it's under a specific uh, stress or stimulation, it releases a significant amount of this uh, hormone, DMT, and it's that hormone that facilitates the entering and exiting of the soul in the body. This is what the Jewish sage mystics have been describing in a coded language for literally thousands of years. Through meditation, through fasting, chanting, any number of techniques, uh, there might be um, a burst of endogenous DMT that was correlated with mystical and near-death experiences. Be a role for DMT in explaining any number of hallucinatory phenomena you know, that man has experienced you know, throughout his history. Creativity, imagination, dream states, changes that occur due to isolation, trauma, starvation, uh, all of which produce hallucinatory phenomena. These hallucinatory phenomena are explainable uh, by the presence of compounds known to produce hallucinations. And the only compounds that we know of that are capable of doing this are the class of compounds known as hallucinogens. When thinking about spiritual states, I think endogenous hallucinogenic compounds and molecules that the brain can potentially release are probably very relevant to this topic because on one hand, they may really help us to elucidate what is the neurochemical mechanism of these experiences. I mean, if we can say that there's a release of endogenous opiates or we can say that there's a release of dopamine or something like that and we can measure that release and we can see where in the brain those different molecules go what receptors they activate or deactivate and hence we can really learn a lot more about what these experiences are because it really can allow us to match up these experiences that people have with hallucinogens as well as understanding where they are related in the context of the brain's receptors and, and the different parts of the brain that can may or may not become active. DMT flash makes it clear that uh, disembodied consciousness is a possibility. I think that the whole tension of history and the tension of life seems to be about the shedding of the body. Terence was uh, very, he was a good promoter. Basically, he said it's, it's the ultimate metaphysical reality pill, and even though it's not a pill, but uh, I thought that was a pretty good characterization after I took it. it you know, so people would, would, you know, try to go out into these other realities, but they didn't have a basis for it. There, there weren't uh, wisdom traditions, and elders, there weren't like connections of shamanic lineages. So people would go out and they would kind of like smash apart. Timothy Leary really so discredited a scientific approach to studying this because he, I mean, he started off doing interesting research and then got into uh, advocating use in a way that was incredibly threatening. Culturally, we reacted and, um, and politically, uh, it became impossible to do this uh, sort of research. I know the sense of uh, another realm that was there. My sense was at, at some point, there was this implicit sense, this is the divine realm. This is the divine realm. And it, it was not like a thought, but it was like this implicit kind of grokking recognition. It was all very, very impersonal until I got to the space where I realized that I was in the area where souls await rebirth. And I was there and I had been there so many times before. I recognized it and this incredible transcendent peace came over me. I have never in my life ever felt such peace. Everything was stripped away. Every hope, every fear, every attachment to the material world was completely stripped out of me. I was free to just be the essence of a soul. It 
it's the brain that helps us to process all this information and to create for us a rendition of what our world is all about. But we're trapped within that brain. However, in spiritual experiences where people feel that they get beyond the self, in certain types of psychedelic experiences where you have incredible sensory and other types of phenomena, uh, people really feel like they are able to kind of get outside of their brain. We have to take a very big look at what is going on within them when they have the experience and try to understand how it happens physiologically and try to make sense of it from the subjective perspective as well as from the objective perspective. I don't think you can just say, let's just explain it away on the basis of science. And that's the kind of thing that you can see on psychedelics, if you don't get trapped in the beauty and awe of the psychedelic experience itself. You know, it's like, it's like looking through the chandelier of reality from a different vantage point. You know, the curiosity, perhaps the uniqueness of the human creature is that we live in both realms. We have, we have the ability for, for spiritual experience and we have the ability for, for physical experience. The agenda of, of the spirit world, if there, if there is, is an agenda, uh, is to allow us to experience our full potential and to deliver our full potential. And maybe the choices that we are making right now as a, as a civilization and a society rebound far beyond ourselves. It seems our reality is not the only reality. Occasionally the cracks reveal themselves and may even want to be discovered. As humans, we are creatures that thirst for knowledge. We spend time, money, and infinite energy searching for it in schools, in churches, in business, and in technology. Knowledge is power and thus our greatest quest. Dimethyltryptamine, a molecule with a complex name and the simplest ability to unlock the door to another dimension. And perhaps, just perhaps, our future evolution. <laughs> <laughs> so, the thing that I hear the most about you, and you can tell me if this is true or not, is that you have power of levitation. And as a magician, this is something that I'm fascinated with. Ah, your magic is fantastic. But uh, we're not the same the Buddhist, uh, Buddhist uh, meditations. Yes, I understand. I know you don't want to teach me how to do it or tell me any of your w what you do, but maybe I could just witness it. You come from very far away. You, you show me your scale. I don't know what happened, but I will try one time. Okay, great. I need you back. If you still close me, then my uh, energy doesn't roll. Yes. Okay.
Have you guys seen this? Ready? Okay, one, two, three, okay? One, two, three! <laughs> <laughs> 